Do we have too much government? We need to put uh, people in ahead of corporate profits. This system is so lopsided. This threat is a real threat to democracy. And I think that's really important. That's something we haven't been doing in this country for a long time. Where do you start? What do you do? How do you do it? Access to Democracy and other Egan Community Television programming is supported by Thomson Reuters, makers of Westlaw Next and based in Egan. Through Westlaw Next and other innovative online services, Thomson Reuters is the world's leading source of intelligent information for businesses and professionals. Online at ThomsonReuters.com and by U.S. Federal Credit Union the member-owned financial institution offering service, value, and experience you can trust to the greater Twin Cities community. Hello and welcome to this edition of Access to Democracy. I'm your host today, Steve Francisco, and it's a real special privilege and pleasure for me to introduce today's guest, Professor Hy Berman, Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Minnesota. Welcome to Access to Democracy, Hi. Good to be here again. And I should tell our viewers who may realize you're a return visitor yes. to Access to Democracy. Uh, our friend and colleague Alan Miller has previously interviewed you for this show. Uh, this is my first time getting to interview, interview you today, yes. even though you and I have known each other, believe it or not, going back over 34 years. That is correct. In the interest of full disclosure for our viewers, I should tell folks that Professor Berman, I was a former student of his when I was an undergraduate at the University of Minnesota, and I was in your American Labor History course in 1978, and I had many professors during my time at the University of Minnesota. You were my favorite. Well, thank you very much. And I'm not saying that simply because you're the guest well, on the I'm, show I'm, today. Well, I'm here. That's the only way you were able to get me. <laughs> is to tell me that you're going to say this on the air. It pays to have connections. Yes, yes. So, hi, what I'd like to ask you to start out with is why did you become a historian? Well, that's a good question. You know, when I initially uh, was going through school, I went to a very special uh, high school, a very highly uh, competitive high school, Stuyvesant High School in New York, and that was a high school that was focused on science and technology. And essentially, I was going to be a chemist. Really? Yes. And when I went to City College, I was a chem major to begin with. And when I went through my advanced chem chemical courses, I said to myself, what am I doing? <laughs> I am reading from a cookbook and following a cookbook, making experiments out of a cookbook. I'm not going to, I didn't go here to learn culinary of, 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 of traits. I came here to really look at the world and try to change it. I still was an idealist. Mm -hmm. So it was th at this point that I had a, an interest in history, and I started taking history courses. And I think I'm the only graduate of the City College of New York that had a major in history and graduated with a major in history and had a Bachelor of Science degree, not a Bachelor of Arts. Really? Interesting. Yes, because my, my pre preparatory courses in the first two, three years were focused towards the science mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a Bachelor of Science in History. No one else in this city college has that. I do. Mm -hmm. Then I went on to Columbia, and uh, the question is, what should I focus on on my graduate work? And my parents uh, came from uh, Eastern Europe, immigrants, not well-educated, factory workers, garment workers, uh, trade union activists, political activists. And I said, well, why shouldn't I write my dissertation about, not their experience, but an ancillary experience that they went through? And uh, since my parents were in the men's clothing act mm -hmm. activity, I wrote on the ladies' garment workers. The and ILGWU. That's right. That, that doesn't exist anymore. Well, I guess it still does, but... Right. You know, through very, a couple of mergers, yes. now I think it's known as Unite Here. Yeah, whatever yeah. it is. But anyway, uh, when, I, when I wrote that, of course, David Dubinsky was the president, right. and it was a very important union, both 
in the economy of the city of New York mm -hmm. and in the politics of the nation. So you're becoming a historian, actually. <clears throat> uh, it kind of tracks closely to your own life experience and your family's, Absolutely. especially because of your interest in American labor history, yes. with both of your parents being active in the labor movement mm -hmm. in New York, but also um, your interest in immigration history yes. in the United States, exactly. too. Exactly. So um, what was it that drew you to Minnesota? Well, I mean, I, I, I was my first teaching position after getting my doctorate at Columbia was at Brooklyn College in New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, after three years, the chairman of the Brooklyn College History Department, John Hope Franklin, the most distinguished historian of black America that is in the world. Recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, correct. I believe. Uh, John yeah. Hope calls me into his office and he says, I've got good news and bad news for you. The good news is that you've got tenure. The bad news is you have to stick around here. Uh, by that he meant, of course, we had a five-course teaching load, hmm. five course per semester. You couldn't do anything but teach. Mm -hmm. And we had, you know, research ambitions and things like that, and he did as well. He said, I'm leaving Brooklyn. I'm going to the University of Chicago. I think you should too. And I said to him, John, I said, I've got a bird in, in, in the hand. Why do I want to look for a bird in the bush? A job's a job. He said, well, We'll see. Well, a couple of weeks later, I got a phone call from Michigan State University, and they offered me a job, and I went to East Lansing. It was a permanent job, mm -hmm. so we bought a house and started settling in, and at, uh, oh, four or five months after I, I got there, I got a phone call from David Noble, who was my good friend, professor of history at the University of Minnesota, now professor emeritus of American Studies said, we'd like you to come and give a lecture. I said, oh, sure, have notes, we'll travel, you know. <laughs> so I came to, to Minnesota, gave the lecture, and that and evening... And this was what year? This was in 1960. Or, well, no, this was in the, in the spring of 61. Okay. Yeah, spring mm -hmm. of 61. Uh, May, April, May of 61, something like that. And uh, that evening, having dinner, at the chairman's house with other members of the history department, uh, the chairman, Harold Deutsch, said to me, um, I was staying with David Noble at his house, I'll come by and pick you up around 9 o'clock because we have an appointment with the dean. And I said to him, what the hell do I want to see a dean for? You know, I don't need deans. He said, oh, no, you have to. We're making you an offer. I had no idea that you know, I was there to be looked over. Well, I said, hold on a moment. I said, I got to call Betty, my wife. And I called her up and I said, they're making me an offer. She said, hey, does Minneapolis have sidewalks? <laughs> and I said, yes. She said, take the job. Why, well, East Lansing didn't have any sidewalks. Oh and my to her, goodness. sidewalks was a symbol of civilization. So what's happened from 1961 until the present time, obviously you became uh, not just uh, well-established here, but really became one of uh, the University of Minnesota's better-known professors. Some of our viewers may recognize your face because yes. you have appeared on many documentaries mm -hmm. and programs on public television. Yes. You are frequently a guest on uh, mainline commercial television, yes. WCCO and other stations yes. that interview you mm -hmm. about historical events yeah. or, or even current events, current politics. So. Something about Minnesota, though, you've you developed a love affair with well, the state you know, over 50 years. What was it that when, triggered that? When I came here, I, I got a phone call from the president's office. O. Meredith Wilson was president mm -hmm. of the University of Minnesota. And he said, I, I, he wants to speak to me. Now, what did I do wrong? I said to him, oh, the president, the president never calls a new faculty assistant, members, right. faculty member, you know, for a private interview. Well, I should have known better. Meredith Wilson was a historian, mm -hmm. and a good historian. And uh, he had just gotten a big grant from the uh, Ford Foundation, uh, in the history of education kind of grant, to study the uh, impact of education on the immigrant minors and their children mm. in northern Minnesota. And obviously, as president of the university, he couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. So he was looking for a team to work on that. And Clark Chambers, mm -hmm. my colleague at the university, 
who was interested in social welfare history, was to look at the host community. Timothy Smith was brought in as an expert in history of education. He was to look at general public education. And I was asked to look at the immigrants and their communities mm. and how they focused on educational issues, either internally or externally. So I spent the next three years uh, on and off on the Iron Range, mm. where I got to know a young dentist who was then in the school board and in, in, in Hibbing, uh, and through him, his family, this was really Purpich, and we became good friends. Who went on, we should say, to become the longest serving governor in That's the history correct. of the state of Minnesota. And this is a perfect segue, Hi, because I was actually going to ask you next. Yeah. You've, you've not only explained and interpreted history, you've been called Minnesota's historian because of your vast knowledge of our state's history and politics, but your relationship with Governor Perpich, you went from interpreting and explaining history to helping somebody make history. Right. You were one of Governor Perpich's closest confidants and advisors. That is correct. Tell us about Rudy Perpich. Uh, what was he like? Well, I mean, first let me say that this is, I think, very ironic. Here I am, a kid from the Bronx who you know, comes to Minnesota not knowing the difference between Minnesota, Michigan, Montana, all the, the <laughs> M states, you know, and then within a couple of years, by default, becoming Minnesota's historian. I think that is very ironic. Mm -hmm. Now, to get back to your question, uh, Rudy Perpich and I were very good friends. Uh, his family, uh, my family were good friends. Uh, we got to know each other fairly well when he moved here for first in the state senate and as lieutenant governor, we kept in touch. During the time as lieutenant governor, he was uh, running the bicentennial project for the state, and he asked me to help him do that, and I did, you know, doing other things. When he left the lieutenant governorship, became governor, and then appointed Wendell Anderson to the senate, mm -hmm. a step that I argued against, by the way, uh, he. Uh, came to my house, he and Lola, and uh, asked me if I w would help him. And I said I would do anything he wished, um, except take a leave of absence from the university and work right, full time Right, because in fact, you were my professor. You were teaching a full load at the U that while you were advising Governor Perpich. Absolutely. Perpich. And the reason for that, very simply, is that <clears throat> I didn't want to be beholden mm -hmm. to him or to the state. Mm -hmm. Therefore. If we disagreed on policy issues so much so that I couldn't, you know, stay with him, I'd leave. Uh, with a leave of absence, I'd leave and it wouldn't have any pay, mm -hmm. you know, until I came back. So, you know, so I'll, when you think about Rudy Perpich and reflect on his governorship, uh, and he was a historic governor in our state's history, yes. not only the longest serving, but I believe he was the first Roman Catholic governor of Minnesota. Yes. He was the first governor from the Iron Range region yes. of Minnesota, which had never produced a governor. And the first uh, uh, Eastern European. That's right. Uh, Non-Scandinavian, non non-Anglo, right. non-German, yes. And when you think of him, Hi, what do you look back at today as his greatest accomplishments as governor? What did Rudy well, a number, Perpich contribute a, a number to of Minnesota? Greatest. I think one of, one of the major great, great accomplishments he did is, was to open up the whole system of state governance to people who had previously been, if not excluded, then at least kept out. Mm -hmm. You mean in terms of gubernatorial appointments, judgeships? The, 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 we had a, a vacancy in the, in the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And he asked Bill Kennedy, who was then the, uh, uh, the late Bill Kennedy, who was public the, defender. The, the public defender right. in Hennepin County, and uh, Judge Joe Summers of the Ramsey County uh, uh, District Court and I to be his judicial selection committee. I, I asked him, well, look, Rudy, you know, those two guys are lawyers. I'm not a lawyer. He said, that's okay, you'll keep them honest. <laughs> so, <laughs> so but he said, I want three people to be nominated for the, for the, for the court. I want them all to be women. There hasn't been a woman on the Supreme Court. In the state's history. In the state's history. Wow. So we worked and came up together with Rosalie Wall. We, we, came, we had other, two other candidates as well, but Rosalie Wall you know, was chosen. We recommended her and she was chosen. Uh, so that's a great achievement. 
It is, especially when you put it in the context of realizing it's not that big a deal anymore no. for the governor to no. appoint a woman as or a minority, or as Governor Dayton recently did, appointing Wilhelmina Wright to the state Supreme Court, an African-American woman. Exactly. But, but, but it this, was Rudy this, Herpich this was who appoint, appointed the first woman yes, governor. Yes, this was the breakthrough. And he did some other things too, didn't he, Hi, You may have been involved with this. He brought the Center for Victims of Torture to Minnesota. Right. Well, he created the School for the Performing Arts out right. in Golden Valley. Yes. These were some ideas that, that he had oh, yeah, that he brought I, I, to he fruition. Had, he had more ideas in a moment than most governors have in a lifetime. Some of those ideas weren't very good, but that's all right, you know. And, you know but the odds were that there were a couple of good ideas mixed in with maybe some not so good exactly. ideas. Yeah. And he, he was he was peripatetic. He was always on the go, and he was always active. And many times at four or five in the morning, my telephone would ring. Who in the hell would be calling me this time? It was Rudy, of course. You know, he couldn't sleep. He mm -hmm. got an idea. He, he wanted. To Play it off. Did me. you keep a notepad next to your bed so <laughs> that you could? No, I didn't keep a notepad next to my <laughs> bed, nor a tape recorder. <laughs> but uh, oh, so we were very close for the first admit part of his administration. When then he went off to, to control data mm -hmm. as vice president if he lost the right. election seventy eight. Right. That's right. We should tell people he served two non-consecutive non terms. He succeeded well, actually, when he was lieutenant he governor and then... He served for defeated. a little over two years, over two and a half years, Wendell Anderson's term. Right, right. Then v ran for re-election and lost mm -hmm. in 78. Came back in 82 to challenge the, the DFL endorsed candidate, Warren Spanis, in the primary and won and then beat the uh, Republican so let's, candidate. let's jump ahead, if we could, because I see time starting to run yeah. short, too. Yes. I want to ask you, how is his successor, our current governor, Mark Dayton, how do you think Governor Dayton is doing? Well, so far, so good. I mean, uh, I always thought that Mark Dayton's talents were more in the executive side of governance than it was in the He has said side. that he was frustrated in the U.S. Senate oh, I, I, and by his own account wasn't very successful, but right. being a governor you get to make appointments, you get to write budgets, uh, exactly. make proposals to and the that, legislature. And that's his strength. That's always mm -hmm. been his strength. Uh, you know, after the defeat of Rudy Purpich in 78, uh, Mark Dayton was a staff person and, uh, right. uh, for, for, for Rudy, so he then started a think tank. And most of the think tank concepts that he came up with were executive think tanks, mm. policy matters. Mm. And I thought that was always his great strength. So when he went to the Senate, I thought it was a mistake. And But when he became governor, people were looking at him in terms of his Senate career and saying, oh, he's going to be a big failure. Mm -hmm. I said, no. And he'll no. be facing re-election in two years, That's in correct. November 2014. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you yes. know, it's hard to look into the crystal ball and see where things will be. But mm -hmm. have you been surprised that by the fact that his number, his approval rating among Minnesotans seems to be higher than a lot of people would have expected? I'm not surprised. You're because, not? You know, I think, I think uh, what he did uh, you know, in the first couple of years of his gubernatorial uh, right. term was to really uh, do some creative things and uh, to confront uh, mm -hmm. the uh, long hiatus of lack of leadership mm -hmm. in the governor's office by that hiatus. I'm talking about, well, if not all the years since Rudy Perpich was defeated, at least part of those years. Because mm -hmm. Arnie Carlson was, was, was a decent governor. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the uh, Ventura Palenti era was, of course, an mm -hmm. era of, well, should I say, stagnation in right. terms of leadership. Um, let's shift back to one of your specialties and one of my great interests, uh, unions yes. and labor in America. Um, as we sit here today in 2013, uh, unions represent the smallest percentage of the private sector workforce that they have in 80 years. Certainly oh. since the creation well, of the than National eight. Labor Relations Act, more, than, more than that. It's and it's we're down at a point where many people are really questioning whether we're even going to have unions in another 15, 20 years. What I want to ask you, Hi, is how has labor gotten to this point? And, and also, what, if anything, can unions do to change that dynamic? It seems to me like it's more than it's more than coincidental that at the same time we've seen unions decline politically, 
that we've also seen the erosion of the middle class. Absolutely. And you now have yep. uh, millions of Americans who say that they think they'll have lived a better life than their children yes. were. What are your thoughts well, about Well, it's this? very complex, but the, there are a number of different factors involved. Mm -hmm. Part of it is, of course, globalization and the move of jobs out, of ma particularly manufacturing jobs, out of the United States. Part of it is a, is a climate of political hostility uh, to the labor movement that started with even before Ronald Reagan. I mean, when he uh, fired the air traffic controllers yeah, yeah, but that was in the, 81. That was a yeah. symbolic kind of state statement when a president who had been a labor leader himself right. came out and said, hey, this is the end. But before that, even under Jimmy Carter, it mm -hmm. wasn't fairly. The high point of union membership was 1940s? No, no. The high point of union membership was 50s. 1950s, 60s, in, into the early 70s. And it was approximately what? 35 to 37 percent of mm -hmm. the labor force. And we're down now to what? Nine? 11, 11 percent. 11 percent. Uh, nine percent of the private sector labor force, mm -hmm. eleven percent totally. Of course, the public sector labor force has raised raised that. You figure. mentioned globalization. How about the shift to in the economy from really uh, an economy where industrial jobs were much more important right. to much more of a service-oriented economy? That's and it seems that that's created difficulties for unions in penetrating those workplaces. Absolutely, the uni union movement has always been very weak in trying to get into non-blue-collar kinds of activities, mm -hmm. except in terms of, except for public employees. Mm -hmm. And then public employees o have only become a significant union factor since the 1960s and early 70s. Mm -hmm. Remember, Minnesota didn't pass a Public Employee Labor Relations Act until 1971. So. And Didn't the, that come out of the Minneapolis teachers' strike? That came out of the Minneapolis teachers' strike, right. yes. Yeah, and that and established and collective right. bargaining right, which something which in Wisconsin, Governor Walker uh, succeeded to, in to taking destroy. away. And, and of course, Wisconsin had that as well, you know. Yeah. They, you know but now they don't. But uh, even before that, in the, uh, during the Kennedy administration, uh, President Kennedy's executive order to allow for unionization of federal employees, in fact, raised the federal the uh, the public employee sector unionization mm -hmm. to a point where it began to almost be equal to it, the it private really, sector. It really strikes me as something of a kind of a modern tragedy. What has happened with unions in our country, and and the erosion in bargaining power, and you see it reflected in average uh, wages. Absolutely. Uh, the erosion in earning yes. power. The erosion in benefits, beginning with health care, you don't see defined benefit pension plans anymore. No. You see defined contribution plans. A whole long list. Right. But are, do unions also bear some of the responsibility Absolutely. for yeah. this predicament? It but seems that labor has not done as good a job either at yeah. telling its own story about its successes and what it has contributed to the America that we know today. That is correct. And also, some argue that, uh, that the labor movement made a fundamental error, political error, uh, back in in the 30s and 40s by tying itself uh, irrevocably to the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. It should have been much more independent and had a more independent political role. Uh, consequently, being so closely tied to the Democratic Party meant that the Democratic Party could ignore it. Mm -hmm. That it actually no, leads no. into a question that I wanted to ask you today. You hear uh, people seem to think all Demo or all union people are Democrats, which actually is not true. No. If surveys of union people show that maybe 60 some percent, 70 percent, maybe are Democratic reliably, but also about a quarter of union members predictably vote Republican. Yeah. And there are some union members who believe, as you've alluded to, high that neither the Democrats nor the Republicans really represent the interests of working right. people. There are calls for a new labor party sort of along the model of maybe the European type labor mm -hmm. parties where workers have an organized voice in government. Right. Do you, what is your prediction on that? Do you think that there is any possibility at all given that a labor party could emerge here, oh, a given, viable labor party? Uh, given, given our federal system and the difficulty of, of having a, a, an alternative to a two-party system, uh, structural ideological differences, difficulties. I don't think that that's oh, that that would probably that would work. Uh, what I think could work would be the labor movement being much more like a nonpartisan league, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, from North Dakota. Yeah, the yeah well, model. but by that I mean putting their strength behind specific candidates hmm. and specific parties who are willing to accept an agenda that really serves the interests of the labor movement and not tie itself to the Democratic Party. Say to the Republicans, hey, you know, you can get our vote too if you do th certain things. Well, it, that was tried in, in Minnesota, at least, in 1886, when the, the uh, labor movement, then the Knights of Labor, went to the Democratic and Republican parties, said, accept our platform and our candidate. You know, what, do you, what do you think happened? The Republicans accepted the, the platform and the Democrats mm -hmm. accepted the candidate, and they were, you know. Let, let me ask you this about when we look at where labor could go, because historically, and it's, this was true in your own family, as you explained at the beginning of this interview, that unions in this country really took off when they appealed to immigrant workers That's who right. were looking for jobs, who were looking for health care, who were looking for vacation, yes. eight hour a day, prohibition on child labor. And if labor is going to have a new chapter in America, could it lie with the ranks of the new immigrants yes. that are coming to America? And even right here in Minnesota, where our population and demographics have changed significantly yep. just in the past 20 years with the influx of Hmong, Ethiopian, uh, Somali, mm -hmm. uh, Vietnamese, people from Latin America, from Mexico particularly. What, what are your thoughts well, about I, that? Well, I, I think we see that happening already. The phenomenal growth in the last two decades of the Service Employees International Union would represent people like that in the lowest and the most menial jobs in our economy. And they've been growing. They've been growing. And that, uh, that continues to, mm -hmm. to, to, to happen. Final, so I think that's going to happen. Final yes. quick question. We're down to about a minute high. Yep. I've got to ask you about our current predicament politically, oh. nationally. Yes. Here we are sitting today on March 1st. Yes. We're facing down the barrel of sequestration mm -hmm. across the board cuts. Right. We seem to be a very divided country right yes. now politically. Do you see this continuing for a while? No. Any prospect of change, or are we stuck in a rut here for a while? I think we're stuck in a rut. We have political gridlock, and the political gridlock is not because the electorate has not spoken its, its mind. But it they has. are speaking. They're yeah, divided. The but no, the electorate is not divided. If you look at the vote totals of, of, the, of Democratic and Republican Congress, okay candidates, you see that the Democrats outpolled the Republicans by close to two million votes. Significant. But uh, redistricting has made the Congress Republican and Tea Party. Yep. I obviously we are going to have to have you back. Right. We are going to have to continue this discussion. Yes. I thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, Professor Emeritus High Berman, University of Minnesota, and a dear friend. Thank you, High. You're quite welcome.